So I want to make up a Blu-ray disc because I'm doing high definition footage, I'm going to make up a Blu-ray disc. What I do now is exactly the same if I'm going to make up a DVD, but let's make up a Blu-ray disc. So I'm going to save it. Like I said, regularly save it, and if you're going to do anything big like make up a disc or a Blu-ray disc, please make sure that you save it. The other thing I would say is that if you happen to, for whatever reason, to have an in and an out point stuck on the timeline, get rid of them before you go into making a disc. If you can remember it, the keyboard shortcut to get rid of both the in and the out point at once is the X key on the keyboard. So ideally, before you're going to make a disc, click Save, click X, go to the next thing I'm about to show you. If you can't remember that keyboard shortcut, so you already have an in point and an out point for some reason, they always pop up all the time. If you can't remember the X, how else can you possibly get rid of it? Well, these little buttons up here put in and out points on, and there's a little drop down next to it. You'll find that with a lot of the buttons inside of EDIUS. There's always a main thing and a bit of extras. Let's go to the bit of extras for the in point. And what have I got? I've got clear in point. Same on the out, clear out point. X is quicker. I'm trying to remember X. So get rid of your in and out point, and then you want to go and make your Blu ray disc. So, how do you do that? Come up here to File, and you've got lots of possible options, but I want to export and use Burn to Disc, which is Edius's built in Blu ray and DVD writing. So when you've opened up Burn to Disc, it comes up with this interface. And the first thing you can see here is the basic tab, which was added in about EDIUS 6.5. And this is you know, fairly basic. Are you making a DVD or a Blu-ray disc? I'm in a high definition timeline, so I'm going to make a Blu-ray disc. If I wanted to, I could just tick that, and then I would make a DVD instead. And it would resample or remake my video and resize it down to standard definition, all just by ticking that button. EDIUS actually can do very, very good scaling of footage, but it doesn't do its best by ticking that button. So if I was on a high def timeline and I was going to make a DVD, I wouldn't just simply tick that. I'd do something else, which we do explain in the output section of our tutorial. For now, I'm just going to leave it at Blu-ray. Next question, am I going to do MPEG-2 or H.264? You notice if I chose DVD, I've only got the option of MPEG-2 because all DVDs have to be in MPEG-2. If I go to a Blu-ray, I've got two options, MPEG-2 or H.264. H.264 is pretty much the standard way of doing video on a Blu-ray disc. You can squeeze it, you can get more in a disc than you can in MPEG-2, and it's the way I would prefer to do it. On the other hand, it's a little bit more complicated than doing MPEG-2. So making MPEG-2 is actually quicker. Now, it's quicker unless you have a system that can do a thing called Intel QuickSync, which is what I've got. Intel QuickSync uses something which is built into the latest Intel processors, which is basically a hardware encoding H.264 chip. It can knock up Blu-ray discs very, very fast. It can actually do H.264, which is the better format, faster than MPEG-2, as long as your computer is capable of it. So I'm going to leave it at H.264, because I can do it really, really fast. Next question, do you want to use a menu or no menu? I'm not going to do a menu, so I click on that. Now, as soon as I go to no menu, you might notice I've got two other tabs are here. When menu is ticked, they're lit up. When no menus are ticked, they go blank. And the reason for that is these two tabs are all to do with setting up menus. And I'm not doing any menus, so now they don't do anything at all. Okay, that's me basics. I'm doing a Blu-ray in H.264 without a menu. Next thing, what am I actually going to include on the disc? What video? So you go to movie and it will automatically add in the timeline that you were working on. Now, if you want to add in any more, maybe you have two or three or four timelines in your project, then you click Add Sequence, up comes a box, and then you can add in more timelines. Now, I don't have any other timelines in this project, so I haven't got anything to add in. Why would you have different timelines in the project? If you think of a typical kind of commercial disc, then normally you'll have the main menu, which will be one timeline, You'll have extras, 
which will be another timeline, and then trailers, which might be a third timeline. So you might have three separate timelines, and they'll produce three buttons on the menu, and then people will choose which one they're going to play. You can either add in a sequence, or you can add some file on the hard drive. I tend to actually bring everything into EDIUS, set it all up on a timeline, and then add it in that way. The bar up here shows you how much of the disk you're using up. Now this is currently set here for 25 gig. that's a single layer Blu-ray disk. If I click on the little drop down here you can see I can do single layer or I can do dual layer or I can even do a Blu-ray disc on a dual layer DVD, that's what this thing is, 7.5 gig blah blah blah. I tend not to use that one because we found they've been less compatible with players than either of these two and in fact most of the time I just do single layer Blu-ray discs. They've come down to a reasonable price these days. You can get nice printable ones off of our website and you can get you know, a couple of hours on that in full HD quality, assuming you're doing H.264. Looking at the title itself, there's a little settings button, so if I click on that, it comes up with all the settings. Now, generally, I leave that on automatic. There's a slight change when I'm making a DVD, but I'll talk about that later. Mainly, I just let it go on automatic and leave it at it. If I don't want to do it on automatic, I can take it off automatic and then choose to change certain things. But generally, I leave it all on auto. So, I've chosen what kind of disc I'm making. I've chosen the timelines I want to be included. So these two don't work because they're all about menus. All I've really got to do now is go to write. And the options here are fairly simple. Volume label. This is the label that's going to pop up on the disc when you pop it into a computer. When you're putting it into a set-top player, you won't see these words at all. You'll only see it when you put it into a computer, and it'll come up with a name next to it. So you could completely ignore it, or you could write something in. In the DVD and Blu-ray video spec, it's very limiting what you can actually put in the volume label. And as I'm hanging over that word video there, you'll notice a little tooltip has popped up. It is saying what characters you're allowed to use. It says only 0 to 9 and A to Z and underline can be used. So no hashes, exclamation marks, quotation marks and so on. That message is also very, very specific. So suppose I came in here and I typed something like video. That is actually not a volume label that I'm allowed to do. And the reason is it's not in capitals. As you notice, the little tooltip says A to Z in capitals. It doesn't say lowercase. And in fact, if I type that in there and then try and make the disk, it won't work. It'll only work if I type in capitals. Apart from that, the rest of this is pretty straightforward. How many disks do you want? Select the drive if you've got. I've got one Blu-ray drive in this computer. See, I can click on that, eject it, bang a bank disk in. And all I've really got to do here is click this button here, Create Disk. Currently greyed out. The reason why it's greyed out is fairly simple. I haven't put a disk in the drive, but if I was to put a disk in the drive, wait for it to be seen. Now you see, hey, as soon as the disk has been seen, I can click Create Disk and burn it. There are a couple of useful options here. As you can see, there's an Option tab, so if I click on that, this is where I would say if I've got menus, you know, what pops up first, do you show the menu or the movie? What happens after you get to the end of the movie? This lot at the top is greyed out because that's all to do with menus and I don't have a menu. This section at the bottom here is the only bit where I can change this and it's what happens when I get to the end of my movie. If you remember, I've just got one movie. So what happens when I get to the end? Tick on that, it'll go back and repeat the movie and just go in an endless loop. Tick on that and it'll just stop. So choose one of those two. If I come back to the Output tab, there is also an Enable Detailed Settings box here. So if I tick on that, this is just telling you where it's making all the temporary files. Now this is quite important because if you're making up a Blu-ray disc, and a Blu-ray disc is about 25 gigabytes in size, it actually needs about 50 gigabytes to make up all the temporary files. You notice mine has gone on the default location, which is the C drive. And generally I don't like making stuff on the C drive, so I will always tick that and then choose somewhere else. I'm going to make up a folder on one of my other drives, and I'm going to let it go there. Now having set that, it should remember that for your next session. And if you've got a DVC system, we'll have already set it for you. 
But that one's quite important, because if you set it to go up on your C drive and your C drive does not have 50 gigs free, then you find out that it'll actually keel over halfway through the transcoding. It actually might pop up with a message saying, oh, you haven't got enough space before it starts encoding, if it thinks you haven't got enough space. So that's good, at least you won't have to wait for ages, but it's vaguely possible it might actually get on with it and then run out of space and then fail. So make sure that that is somewhere where you've got lots of space and I would always keep it off of the programs drive. Keep everything as far as possible away from the place where Windows is. Makes life easier. I do have some other tick boxes down here. Simple things like verifying the disk. Quite like to do that. If I'm gonna write the disk straight away, I'll verify it afterwards. So now all I need to do is click on the create disk and off it goes and it starts encoding. Now, like I said, I have Intel QuickSync in this computer because I have got an Intel Haswell processor. That basically means it can knock up my H.264 files very, very fast. Yep, the job's already done. Now, I've only got a small disk here. It's only about 40 seconds, so it wouldn't take very long. But if I'm doing an hour disk and I've got Intel QuickSync on my computer, It'll take about 20 minutes or so to knock that up into the right kind of format instead of taking three or four hours. So it's very, very good to have Intel QuickSync. If you haven't got QuickSync, then you may consider actually using that MPEG-2 box. There's nothing wrong with MPEG-2. It is a bit old fashioned. It's how we made DVDs, but it can still do very good video. And there's nothing wrong with using it. It's just you can't squeeze it as much. I wouldn't want to put two hours onto a Blu-ray disc in MPEG-2 format whereas I'd be reasonably happy with a couple of hours in H.264. Three hours in H.264 on a single layer Blu-ray disc is still going to look a bit ropey. It would look even ropier in MPEG-2. If you've got Intel QuickSync, then don't bother just do that all the time. If you haven't, you might consider using the MPEG-2. Now, how do I know that I've got QuickSync on this computer? Well, apart from the fact I know my computer, I have this little tick box here that says use hardware encoder. And that is telling me to use the QuickSync. It should only appear if you've got QuickSync on your computer and it's all plugged in properly. We have a video on our website we did with EDS6, which is all about how you set up QuickSync and how you've got to make sure the screens are plugged in in the correct places. You have to have one plugged into your NVIDIA or ATI card and another screen plugged into your motherboard graphics socket. So you have to have it plumbed in properly and set up properly. But assuming you've got that, hardware encoder will appear, it'll be ticked automatically and you'll knock up your Blu-ray discs an awful lot faster. Right, so having finished that, I'm going to click on return. It says, do you want to return to EDIUS with save? What that means is, if you click yes, it'll save the layout of the DVD that you've just knocked up. If you click no, it'll forget it. If you click cancel, it stays where you are. If you click yes, that means you can go back into EDIUS, you can make some changes. If you put in chapter points, you can move them around. And then when you go back into Disk Burner, it will have noticed all those changes and updated automatically, which is nice. 